Okay, so as I say, you're all very welcome this afternoon. We are here for a very important discussion, as I mentioned earlier, which is keeping women's literature in print, um, because we've seen far too much good literature by ladies go out of print, um, and also an attempt to revise the canon as well. And so I'm delighted this afternoon to be joined by Alan Hayes of Ireland House, Ireland's leading feminist press for many years now. Um, I'm also joined by Marion Therese Keyes, not to be confused with the other Marion Keyes, <laughs> and Leah Mills and Catherine Dunn here on my right. Um, so I am just going to start by introducing each person. So Catherine is the award-winning author of 11 novels and one work of non-fiction, An Unconsidered People, exploring the lives of Irish immigrants in 1950s London. An updated edition was published in October 2021. Catherine received the Irish Pen Award for Outstanding Contribution to Irish Literature in 2018. Leah Mills writes fiction, literary essays and memoir. Her novel, Fallen, was the Dublin Belfast Two Cities, One Book selection in 2016. In April, a new edition of her first novel, Another Alice, was published as part of the Ireland Classic Literature series. Leah is the current chair of Irish Pen, and she recently completed a PhD in creative writing. Marion Therese Keyes is enjoying a busy freelance career since retiring from Dunleary Lexicon, where she programmed festivals, exhibitions, and events. She has co-authored several local history publications with New Island Books, including People on the Pier and Divine Illumination. Her latest book is A Life of No Light Toil, the Anna Marie Fielding Hall Reader, published this year by Arlen House. Alan Hayes is at the helm of Arlen House. It was originally founded by Catherine Rose in 1975 to redress the underrepresentation of women authors in Ireland. And as I mentioned earlier, it remains one of Ireland's most important, if not the most important, I would argue, feminist presses. Um, Alan is dedicated to revising the Irish literary canon. And I'm going to start our discussion uh, with Alan this afternoon. Um, Alan, would you like to give us a background to this classic literature series? Thank, thanks, Tanya. It's great to be back here in Bray. And congratulations to Tanya for doing such extraordinary work. Um, the, Tanya mentioned about keeping books in print. The actual problem in the 70s was getting women a book deal in the first place. It wasn't even keeping the books in print, it was actually getting them to have the opportunity to publish books. And the person responsible in literary terms for making that happen was Yvonne Boland. And she's still not been given the credit for that absolutely pioneering work she did. Um, in the 70s, when feminist publishing in Ireland started, it was very political. You know, the early books were on feminist theory, feminist politics, women's history, the body. You know, Ireland House in the mid late 70s published the first book on the menopause. That sold 20,000 copies, because there was nothing for women in Ireland going through the menopause. So they were very much focused on legal, political, social um, issues. So a few people said, what about literature? And there was actually, a, a, Mary Dorsey will remember some of this because she was involved in the feminist movement in the mid-70s. There was actually a bit of a backlash to using limited resources that the feminist movement had towards creative things because there were obviously so many legal and political uh, inequalities against women. Uh, but it was actually Terry Prone had the idea for the first anthology of women's writing in Ireland. And Yvonne Boland took that up. She was a judge. Of the comp it was a competition, a thousand women who had never published a, a short story uh, submitted to this competition. The, the ten uh, best stories were selected in an anthology called The Wall Reader. This was 1978-1979. Uh, the, the competition and the book got a fierce backlash by the media, both by female journalists and male journalists. And they all said, there's no need for a competition for women writers. Women have the same access to publishing 
as men do, which of course even now is not 100% accurate either. Then it was uh, uh, utterly wrong. So Arlen House published the book. To everyone's surprise, it became a number one bestseller and was at the top of the charts for five weeks. And one of the contributors to that book is actually Mary Rose Callahan. That was her very first story, and Mary Rose is here today. Um, so that was the, literally the beginning of literary publishing, feminist literary publishing. Um, that, that was 1978, and Ivan Boland was the catalyst for that. Uh, and then in the mid-80s mid with Arlen House, Mir uh, Ivan started the whole workshop culture, which originally was for women poets, and then a huge amount of um, short fiction writers and novelists joined those workshops. So a lot of the current generation of women writers, women in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, got their grounding then. So when we talk about Irish literature now, it's, it's very much a female-driven <coughs> camp. All the lists you see in newspapers, that's all women in a row. A lot of the awards are going to women. That work started in the 70s. That, that is not a, a reflection just of the current diversity and woke campaigns. It literally goes back decades. So that's the beginning. And that's how, um, when Yvonne Bol Boland joined the board of Ireland House in 1978, her first role was, uh, her first, not role, um, her first vision, and I will use the word vision, was to help support new women writers. But in the same breath, she wanted to revise the canon to bring back dead women who were dead and were forgotten about. And the first one was Kate O'Brien. Because Yvonne, only a few years earlier, had had Kate O'Brien to dinner in her house in Dundrum and was fascinated by her. And Kate was one of those extraordinary women who sold millions of books all around the world, but was reviled in Ireland because of a couple of sentences in a couple of books. And you know, two of her books were banned here, but her books were very much um, frowned upon by Catholic society. But she was an extraordinary writer. So Yvonne, in 1980, published the first uh, of the classic literature books, which was The Ante Room. And again, it sold in many, many thousands, went into reprints. Um, and then two more, and then Nora Holt, Janet McNeil, a load of other women were published in that series. So it's a really important series. So um, I'm actually, the last time I met with Yvonne, our last meeting was actually in Senate House Library in London. And I remember sitting down beside her and I told her I'd bought the rights to Kate O'Brien's rarest novel. And her face lit up because she was so gobsmacked. Um, and I told her I was revising the classic literature series. Uh, reviving, I should say. So she was very pleased. And the, so the first book was Kate O'Brien's Pray for the Wanderer, which ironically is Kate O'Brien's response to banning a writer being banned in Ireland and De Valera's Catholic Ireland which, as I would point out, 2022 is not that far away from the 1930s. There are, there are signs of, of that banning and bad behaviour still in play now towards women. So that's the background. So, for example, Marion's book is actually a completely new book. You know, it's, it's um, ten, 10 sections with new, intro, new, new general introduction, new section introductions. Marion is an expert in Anna Maria Fielding Hall uh, with decades of knowledge and just went through an enormous amount of, of her output, which was phenomenal. She was a huge name in the 19th century. But even towards the end of her own life, she, some of her books were out of print and she was forgotten. Yeah, will I just add to that? Yeah, yeah, because um, I used to work in London in the National Art Library in the V&A and um, I first came across Anna Maria Fielding Hall when I was cataloguing a large collection of children's books, 80,000 in the Rainier collection. And I kept coming across Anna Maria Fielding Hall. I was wondering, I'd never heard of her. But so many of the settings were in Ireland, the themes were Irish, and many of the characters. And the books were beautiful. They were beautifully illustrated gift books. So 
that started my passion with her, her life and her, her work. Now, Maureen Keane brought out a biography um, back in 1997, but I was looking at her illustrated books, and I, I really want to thank Alan for the opportunity to bring this reader together. I did a PhD on her work and her illustrated books, but this book is split up into 10 different sections with an introductory chapter. And then we're, I'm looking at her sketches, her novels, her theater work. Her, she did over 40 books for children. Um, some of them sold 44,000 and were in print for 30 years. So she was incredibly well known, a friend of Mariah Edgeworth, and she just fell off the radar. So there are many reasons for that. Authors nowadays fall off the radar, but that's what fascinated me about her. But just to give you a little word on that. She was incredibly hardworking. Like, I just don't know how she managed to complete all that she did do. They said she, she published about 150 books, but that's probably a conservative estimate. I think she was one of these intrepid Victorian ladies who was on the go all the time. And she and her husband, Samuel Carter Hall, traveled back to Ireland. They had about five trips between 1825 and 40. And their other very well-known book is Ireland, its scenery, character, etc. They traveled all around Ireland, 32 counties and 20 four parts and they I, I was reading about the Wicklow section there's nearly uh, 60 pages in their section on Wicklow they climb the Sugarloaf and they've lots of tales about Glenda Locke and the tour guides and the, the the folklore what she was what they were trying to do is bring the folklore to the people in England and encourage the tourists to come over to Ireland to visit and sample the unique character of the Irish people Yes, it just seems extraordinary, and I think there's so many parallels, as you said, with Kate O'Brien, and I'm actually doing a bit of study, again, with Alan on women writers and illustrators of the 1840s, or sorry, the 1940s. <laughs> um, I'm interested in both, both centuries, but it was a hive of activity with the Talbot Press here in Ireland, with writers, the, uh, you know, Patricia Lynch, she, she'd be well known, but I you know Fuelon, and numerous illustrators, Nora McGuinness, Nano Reed, some of those names would be familiar, but there was a host of writers and illustrators working in the 1940s, and we've forgotten many of them. So again, trying to recuperate, because when Anna Marie Fielding Hall was working in the 30s and 40s in the, in the 19th century, Again, it was an incredibly active time. She was generously sponsoring many writers and illustrators, but some of those names, uh, I was looking at Leticia Landon, some of you might have heard of her, she was a poet. Um, Edgar Allan Poe loved her work. Um, and and she, again, nobody really knows about her, but she was earning about 2,500 per annum in the 1820s on her poetry alone in the annuals. So. This is what we're looking at, really. Why have they faded away? And you work as a librarian, of course, in that years as well, Marion. Is having the books in libraries a way of keeping them alive, and, you know, particularly in the reference section? I think making them visible now in the lexicon in Dunleary. Some of you have been there, but um, on the fifth floor, we started an Irish author collection. And we've got 500 books from Arlen House. Um, so it's making sure that they're available, that people can pick them up. So, and like for example, some, some authors might, uh, I think it was Dermot Healy had died, and we had no books in the library at all of his. Local bookshops didn't have his books. And um, so the idea with this is to have a copy of every book by as many Irish authors as we can and start with the current ones while it's easy. So we have a huge collection there on the fifth floor. Um, but it's permanent and being added to it. Now, I know it's a public library and we have all the copyright libraries, so, but this is just a sense of, especially in Dunleary Rat Down, and it's, it's, it's great to have it there, so um, always adding to it. So there's, there's actually huge gaps in the copyright libraries, and uh, even in the 70s and 80s when libraries were buying books, I, uh, I'm a, I've been doing a long study on Irish publishing, and it's actually fascinating to go through catalogues and you see that the libraries bought every book by the male writers and none of the books by the female writers. And there's enormous gaps 
It's re that's partially why I've, I've actually, over the years, been able to sell a huge amount of books to libraries, both in Ireland and America, because I've been collecting books by Irish women writers for the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. And books that I bought for a pound back in 1992, I can sell now for 40 euro, because they're completely impossible to get. They're, they're long out of print. There are no copies on the internet. So it's very easy for women particularly. Now, men go out of print as well, but it's much easier for women to go out of print uh, because they can be seen as a fad. It's, so in the late 70s, when the Ireland House book, first book started, then Asha came on the scene a few years later, a huge amount of women were published all through the 70s, late 70s, 80s, up to the mid 90s. Then absolute vacuum, because Asha stopped in 1997. So, for example, Nuala O'Connor, who's, who's going to be here after us, uh, when Nuala started writing in 2000, there were literally no publishers actively looking for contemporary Irish women writers in Ireland. There were a couple of women in England. So Claire Keegan had just published her first short story collection in Fa Faber. A um, couple of others, but literally a, a vacuum. So it just shows you how important it is that we, we, we don't let that happen again, because there's no reason to let books yeah. go out of print. And unfortunately, there are still a lot of publishers who are books to go out of print. Um, I, I know, Alan, that it's a, a policy of yours not to, to let books go out of print, which, which I'm very grateful for, because Arlen House has published my two short story collections, and it's just a fabulous thing knowing that they're not going out of print, that they'll, they'll always be there, that Alan won't let them go out. Um, so thank you for that, Alan. Um, I'm, I'm going to move on to our, our fiction ladies now, and one of the things I'm curious about actually, um, so Leah, we mentioned that this was your first book, which has been reprinted by Alan, and um, who decided on that? Was it you or was it Alan? Um, I'm not entirely sure. I, I was working with Alan on um, another very valuable book that he published recently called Look, It's a Woman Writer. Um, which is a collection of essays uh, written by an assortment of women writers. Who cert and that book certainly gives the lie to the fact that women weren't writing throughout the 20th century because there are some fantastic contributions in there. And we were working, uh, well, I mean, Catherine and Alan did a lot of work, and Elish Nukovna was the editor, and it was her idea originally. But we were talking, and... I realized it was 25 years since Another Alice had come out, and that seemed like a significant number to me. And I mentioned it to Alan, and he said that he was putting this classic series together and he would like to publish it. So it was kind of a joint yeah. joint decision, I think. I met yeah. you right after Another Alice first came out. That's right, that's right. And I remember how powerful it was then. And it's just so, it's so shocking that a book like that was allowed to go into print. It's it's the way publishing is going. Just if, if books aren't really selling fast and furious, they go out of print very quickly because so much is being published apart from anything else and there's competition for space on bookshelves and uh, and the industry is changing and more and more people are going to Kindle. Uh, uh, there are a whole lot of economic factors that influence that as well. But yeah, you're right. Books go out of print really, really quickly. It's amazing as well... Um, Leah, the relevance that another Alice still has today, and it, the same I was speaking to Catherine earlier, saying how relevant um, a name for himself is as well, because these are issues that keep coming up time and again. In, in more recent times, I think we've, we've seen a lot more of, of these issues, you know, um, coming up in the news, for instance. But in another Alice, you, you look at things like abuse, at addiction, at mental health issues, and they're obviously every bit as pertinent now as they were when the book was published. What does it mean to you, Leah, to see this particular book republished? The microphone got caught in Tanya's book there. Now it's caught in Catherine's book. Um, it means a lot to me, obviously, personally. This was my first novel, and I feel very strongly about it. Um, it's not an issue-based novel insofar as it is fiction. It is a story. It explores a lot of different ideas, but it did arise from a political moment for me. Um, 
and I can tell you about that if we have time, that the novel was conceived one afternoon, I remember it really clearly. I was sitting in a friend's kitchen, reading the paper, drinking tea the way you do, everybody chilling, you know, a bit of desultory chat. And I read an account in the paper of a rape trial that was taking place. And the defense lawyer referred to the fact that the case rested on the mere question of consent. And that word, the mere question of consent, just electrified me. I thought, what other question is there? It's all about consent. Uh, and I started ranting, and um, somebody in the room said, that's his job. So that was the end of that peaceful Saturday afternoon, I can tell you. <laughs> um, and, and it occurred to me, you know, in, in Ireland, it's still the case that somebody, a complainant who brings a rape case to court, is not entitled to separate legal representation. So what that means is that a person is required to give evidence about an intimate, devastating assault to somebody who is highly educated, highly trained, not incidentally highly paid, whose job it is to make them sound like a liar. And that is the way that it, things have improved. I know they've improved, but they're not perfect yet. And I'm sure everybody here remembers the recent Belfast rape case and the way that trial was conducted. And I know it's a different jurisdiction, but it revealed an awful lot about attitudes that we still hold in this country towards sexual assault of any kind. So anyway, this anger um, drove me and I realized that actually what was going on at that time, it was 1992, because of the X case, there were a lot of arguments on the airwaves. Everybody had a position, everybody had an agenda. Nobody was listening to anybody else. Nobody wanted to listen to anybody else. And it occurred to me that the only way to break through those rigid positions was through fiction. Because to me, fiction invites a reader to come into another world and you set your preconceptions aside and you're willing to enter the experience of another character. You're willing to go to places that you might not ever go to in your real life um, and, and explore what that experience might be. And so I thought, it's time to write a novel about this. And I have to say, I didn't particularly want to. Um, but I did, and I was very glad that I did. I'd yeah, I was just going to uh, say on that, Leah, is, is it, um, do you think maybe it's a more palatable way for some people, you know, to not for you, but for readers, you know, to, to become aware of what's happening because it is presented as fiction, but they do know that it's reflecting reality? I think it's to do with the osmosis of fiction. I think that you enter the experience of a book in a different way. You set your judgments and your opinions and your prejudices aside, and you, there's something generous about it, and there's this osmotic effect that fiction has that will draw a reader in behind the lines, and it makes scary things safe. And the thing is, sexual abuse is not new. And it's, um, it may be more apparent now because we talk about it more and because it's more visible in the media because there are TV programs and there's film. Um, but it's not new. There's actually nothing new under the sun. And, but at the time, nobody talked about it. Um, and it was, it was almost unimaginable because we didn't, like with Catherine's book, um, when, when Catherine wrote her novel, the term coercive control wasn't known. But now everybody knows what it is and what it means. So she was writing about something that we didn't really have a name for. Um, we did have a name for sexual abuse, but we didn't have the ability to talk about it. Nobody would. And it was hard to recognize. And there were, there were things happening in society that people would see without seeing. And, and that's really what this novel was for me, it was an attempt to try and unpick the invisibility, you know, to make something apparent and to bring a reader along with the character through that experience of realizing what it was that she had experienced. Thank you, Leah. Um, and I think that silence that you mention, you know, it pervades your novel as well. It, it's, it's an important part of it. I mean, um, when Alice's dad 
drowns and it's clearly a suicide. Um, this story is invented. You know, the mother starts to say, oh, well, you know, he loved swimming and he didn't, you know. And Alice almost starts to believe this because this is the story that she's fed and which she's told to tell other people because nobody wants to to know about the dad's suicide. It, you know, just don't talk about things outside the house. Um, and I think when I was growing up, it was it was certainly like that. You didn't talk about things outside the house, you know? Do you think we're getting better at that? Are we getting, you know, are we getting more straight talking maybe about what, what's really happening rather than trying to cover things up with silences and lies? I think we're getting better at talking, but I think um, things are just going underground in different ways. You know, there are manifestations online, on the internet. Um, yeah, I, th I think people are more willing to talk, but at the same time, when an experience is personal and difficult, it can be really hard to articulate. And there's something about saying something out loud that makes it real, um, and that can be very frightening. Absolutely, and I'm, I'm going to be coming back to that topic with you, Catherine, with silence in a few minutes as well. Um, but Leah, could I ask you maybe to give us a, a flavour of another Alice? Do you want to come up to the podium? Okay, and... Can I say hello, everyone? It's lovely to see you all here on a Friday afternoon. And with the rain earlier, I thought there'd be nobody here, actually. So it's great to see so many people. OK, um, the section that I thought I would read, because I think it, it illustrates something I was trying to do in, in the book. Um, here, Alice is a mother. Her daughter, Holly, is about six years old. And she's been with her friend and Holly's friend Jake, who is about 11. The children have been playing in another room. And while uh, Alice and Jake's mum have been chatting, the kids have been playing, they start tussling. Jake is sitting on Holly, who is trying really hard to get away from him, and she's just screaming the way a child would. And he's laughing because he's so much bigger and stronger than she is, and he's enjoying it. Alice loses it completely. And she overreacts. She shouts at her friend's child. Um, and it's all very tense. And when she goes home, this is where part of what she remembers from her childhood begins to break through what everything that she's been trying to suppress. I should say, most of the novel is written in the third person in the past tense. And that's kind of the surface story of what happens. But increasingly, as the novel goes on, this first person, present tense, breaks through, and it's the voice of Alice as a child saying things as they really were. So after this incident with Holly and Jake, um, when they were back at home and Holly was settled for the night, Alice let herself down into the fog that gathered around her. She stared at the wall and rocked herself back, felt herself shrink. She felt a grand swell of fear. Her skin tingled, alert and apprehensive. A wild rage built up in her. Don't laugh. Don't fucking laugh at me. Suddenly, she was back there feeling everything. She heard laughter as hard fingers dug into her skin. She felt the rage of powerlessness, the futility of trying to get away. Her mother laughed that nervous laugh of hers. Her father held her, tickling her. She didn't want to be tickled. It's so easy for him to hold me and he laughs. No matter how hard I squirm and wriggle and try to pull away, I can't do it. I can't get away from him. The more I fight, the funnier he thinks it is. She's laughing too, as if it's all right. It's not all right, not ever. She doesn't hear me. She's right there and she doesn't see. She doesn't know that I'm being blown out like a candle. Daddy's only playing, she says. It's a game. Daddy's only playing. I hate her for watching and not stopping him. His hard fingers digging deep, unfriendly. I see the red armchair in the corner, his chair. He pulls me towards it. Fingers rush all over me. Sly, 
punishing, tormenting. He's tormenting me. I don't move my feet, but my body drags along behind him. I hate, I hate. If only I could smash and break my way out of here, but I can't. He's cold, hard, flinty, feely, hurting, rock. Rock hard, solid. A wall I can't get past. He holds me with his legs and one arm wrapped around me hard like a chain, leaving one hand free to move around, biting into me, push and poke and prod. My head fogs up. I'm weak, worthless, good for nothing, spoil sport. I'm letting it happen to me again. My body's hurting and hates what's happening to it, but no one else can see. She's laughing. I know it's not a game. I try to tell them I need to pee, but they don't listen. And then I wet my pants and everything, the laughter, the fingers, everything stops. So suddenly I fall to the floor. I can see their disgust. I'm disgusting. Dirty, smelly, wet, pathetic, messy little thing. She tells me to go and clean myself up. I'm sniveling as well, wet everywhere, eyes streaming, nose running, mouth wobbling, and now wet down there as well, cooling pee seeping through my clothes, a slimy little piece of dirt, rotting, rotten. She shook all over. Her head felt heavy as if her neck might snap. She leaned over to rest it on the table in front of her. How many ways can you say rage? How many times? How can you show what it feels like? She reached for some paper and her pen and began to scribble furiously, as if words could release her. But what came out instead were wild, dark slashes across the page, tearing the paper into shreds. I give up. Words fail me. Thank you very much, Leah. That was an extraordinary, powerful reading. Um, and I loved, actually, how you create atmosphere in the novel. And I just, I wrote down a couple of quotes, actually, that I particularly liked, Leah. Um, you had a line quite early in the novel where you were describing the house in which Alice lived, and it was described in a most malevolent way. And I felt it almost encompassed her life in this sentence. It was darkness crouched in the corners and stretched in pools between the furniture. It was a monster that swallowed her up and she lived inside it. It seems quite symbolic, just that line. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Just the, the environment in which she was growing up. Well, it was how I visualized the environment that she grew up, how it felt to her. I mean, a house is a house, but how it feels to the people who live in it is is different. And yeah, and I think that thing about the tickling episode is, again, I was thinking that's the kind of experience that a lot of us have had or have seen and witnessed. But when you think about ideas of consent and power and the difference in physical strength between two different people, um, in Alice's experience, obviously, it's part of the texture of her life. And the house is part of the texture of her life as well. I'm going to throw another quote on at you before I move on to Catherine. <laughs> um, the other thing I loved in this book was how you used music um, to create atmosphere and to show mood. I thought it was fantastic. And um, again, there's an early scene where her father sits in the dark and plays records. And it says, the darker, heavier music meant danger. And when she heard it, she stayed well away from him. But at least she knew where he was, what to avoid. I thought that was brilliant, just that darker, heavier music, just reflecting the, the mood and the atmosphere. And then we have the opposite when she's invited to join the choir, when she realizes that she's got a talent for singing. The music fills her up and she feels light when she joins the choir. Was that something you were aware of, Leah, that this, this use of music? Not initially. I, I have to say that Another Alice was my first novel and I was really teaching myself how to write while, while I was writing it. So a lot of the things, 
even that I say about it now, are things that I've come to understand in the years since then. And talking to people, and Tanya, I have to say thank you for reading it so carefully and for being so positive about it. Um, yeah, readers, are, I mean, a book only comes to life when it's read, you know, it's so important. Um, so the, the idea of, of the music and filling the house, and it was him, and it was anger, and it was drama, and uh, yeah, it, it represented the power that he had to fill the house with whatever was in his mind. I don't even know how you would describe that. Um, but the idea of the choir then, and it, yeah, uh, it, it just seemed like it would be a perfect balance and something that she could have that was hers alone. Thank you, thank you, Leah, for that. Um, I think anybody who, who suffers um, in childhood, they, they never cast it off, you know? And we see that in both novels. Um, it, you know, I, I very much was, was reading that in both how, how the characters, because we follow Alice through various stages of her life, from childhood to motherhood. Um, and then we, we come to your novel, A Name for Himself, Catherine. And, you know, the, uh, the first thing I was struck by was the character is known as Farrell. He's known by his surname. And then when I got onto the next section early in the novel, I was following somebody called Vinnie. And I remember stopping and going, oh, what's happening here? Is, is Vinnie Farrell or is, what's, what's going on here? Um, and I, I thought that was intriguing because Farrell refused to be known as Vinnie. He saw it as the name that his father had given him. Um, and he was trying to create his own identity. Farrell is a deeply complex character. I didn't know how to feel about him. Um, and I, in, in one way, I think we, we can certainly have empathy for him because of his childhood and his family background. Um, but obviously, as the novel goes on, his character evolves and becomes quite something else. Um, but it, it is, I think mainly because of the childhood that he has experienced. Um, how did you feel about Farrell, Catherine? Uh, I mean, being inside his head, writing from his point of view, did you feel empathy towards him? Well, I had quite a lot of nightmares, if that answers your question. Um, he was not a happy place to be. He was a very dark place to be. But I think what I wanted to do was not to make him into a monster because it's very easy if we regard somebody as a monster to feel the distance between us and them. So that somebody who does something appalling is always the other. It has nothing to do with us. So I felt I needed to get into his head to a certain extent uh, and to try and understand what motivated him, uh, what might have led to him being the sort of person that he was. Um, and, and also, I think, because the... The childhood, yes, is there, and it was difficult, and he suffered. But lots of people have childhoods which are difficult and which they suffer, and they manage to find a way out of it. And I remember being very conscious at one point in the book that I needed to give this man a choice in how he behaved and how he was, that it wasn't something inevitable, that simply because somebody came from an emotionally economically and psychologically deprived background that that automatically turned them into the sort of controlling person that he became because I don't believe that for a moment I believe there are choices along the way so for me it was important to give him that moment where he chose to either continue as he was or to become somebody different and that that to me was the pivotal part of the novel but it was definitely important not to present him as somebody who only wanted to exercise control over the woman that he said he loved, because that there's no understanding to be gleaned in that. And like what Leo was saying earlier, you know, I think fiction, I think novels allow us to get to the truth of something through fiction, because they allow us to feel the texture of another life that we that we otherwise would not feel. So he was a very dark place to be, but it was important for me to keep the balance between this is not a monster. This is another human being, and here are some of the choices he made that led him to be the person that he was. And there were undertones from the very beginning. Um, 
the first time he claps eyes on Grace, she's saying goodbye to a colleague. And um, he, he feels jealous. And he doesn't even know this woman, you know? Um, that, was, that was amazing. Like, so he was there from the moment he clapped eyes on her. You know, all she's saying is good night to this man who is very well dressed. And obviously, you know, Farrell has a lot of insecurities. Um, partly, I think, because of his social class. Um, he feels maybe people are looking down on him. He's not as good as them. Um, and this, this question of ownership um, I mean, he obviously has a very conflicted, I'm not even sure I'd call it a relationship with PJ, um, with Grace's father. And there's a moment um, when PJ puts his hand on Grace's arm and he refers to this as, as ownership. And he's thinking, she's mine, she's not yours now. Um, so these signs were there in his character from the very beginning. Um, and you, you, you said there when you were talking, Catherine, about he, you know, he said he loves Grace. Does he love Grace? Well, I think that's the question. Um, certainly, and you mentioned class uh, there, which was certainly something that I wanted to explore. And I deliberately made the man walking out of the building being in a suit while he's there in his overalls. Uh, and he's conscious of his Dublin accent. He's conscious that he's actually, he's a visitor to a world to which he believes he will never belong. And when he sees Grace unconsciously, she becomes for him the possibility of belonging to that class that he has never belonged to before. So there's that. There's also the fact that she's extremely attractive. Um, so there are a whole lot of things at work when he sees her first. Um, but I think that's the point about those kind of controlling relationships. Now, I mean, Leah has mentioned earlier when we started writing these books, and we were writing them pretty much around the same time. And certainly there was a silence around se uh, sexual abuse, particularly child sexual abuse. There was certainly a silence around domestic abuse. Um, I mean, it was only in subsequent um, research that I learned that between, I think it was 1998 and 2022, something like 244 women were killed, most of them by intimate partners. And at the time of writing my afterword for the book, which was February of this year, the Department of Justice was still not collecting statistics. So it was both a social silence, a governmental silence, a psychological silence. It was just something that wasn't ever discussed. Um, and, and while at the time, while the term coercive control wasn't something that was familiar to me, it was something which as writers, you know, and as people, we observe around us all the time. I remember one particular occasion being invited to go out with a friend one evening and I drove to her house and knocked on the door at the appointed time. This was pre-mobile phones. I'm very much pre-mobile phone. Um, <clears throat> this was pre-mobile phone times and there was no answer and I, I was puzzled. So I knocked another couple of times and then thought, okay, she's obviously forgotten and walked away. And as I walked away from the house, I, I don't know why, but I just glanced up at the front bedroom of her house, and I saw her silhouetted there. Mm. So she was there, and I knew she was there, and I began to be deeply suspicious. I didn't know what was going on. Her husband was an incredibly charming man. And the next time I met her, she was with him. They were both together, and they were both very jolly and upbeat, and you know, oh, look what happened to me. I fell down the stairs the other day, and look at the bruise on my arms, and I thought, oh yeah tried to get the conversation going with her on a couple of subsequent occasions, apart from everybody else, obviously, quietly, and we weren't going anywhere. So we're very aware of it then. And I mean, the term coercive control, I believe, was very much in vogue in the 1990s among Californian psychologists. Well, that was kind of mostly pre-easy internet access as well, so I wasn't aware of it. But I think as writers, you know, we sense stuff that's in the ether, that's in the atmosphere. So love for him, because also his, for Farrell, because his, also his siblings had been taken away from him. There is part of that, that that he conceives of as ownership. But again, he gets the opportunity to make that relationship into something different. And he's unwilling to step outside what he sees as his entitlement to have that kind of sway or that kind of control over another human being. And, you know, at the end of it, it's, it's as though it's, you know, 
my entitlement means I have the right to decide what happens to you, even to the extent of I have the right to decide whether you live or die. And we've seen this all too recently in this country as well. We are now, as you mentioned earlier, certainly talking about it a lot more. Um, but it's a national conversation that still certainly needs to continue. And I think it's problematic when love is conflated with ownership. But there's an expert on this kind of um, coercive control called Don Hennessy, who's written a lot of books on the subject. And it's actually very chilling where he speaks about the way in which predators or people who are intent on exercising ownership are instantly drawn and will instantly cultivate kind, loyal, loving women who will believe that the success of the relationship is all theirs. So there is certainly that, that level of entitlement and ownership is in his concept of love. And, and Grace is lovely and she's, she's so supportive and, and for, for quite a while throughout the novel he's quite supportive of her as well, he's quite supportive of her doll making um, but we see this, as I mentioned the jealousy at the start, but we see this increasing paranoia like he's away on a trip and he's phoning her and she's not there and he comes back and he asks her where were you each of these nights and she's been doing very simple things she's been spending time with her family, she, with her family. and uh, you know she, she says where she was each night you know, but he's got this idea in his head that she's hiding something from him. Um, Catherine, would you like to give us uh, an extract now from a name for himself? Uh, maybe my dodgy hip and I. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll be your microphone stand, that's no problem. It's okay, thank you. No, really, Catherine. Sure? Okay. So this, um, just actually segueing nicely into what uh, Tanya has been saying there, this is probably the first uh, incident where he if Arl arrives back to the flat and finds Grace not where he has expected her to be. So she's obviously not there to see this particular sign. And because she loves him and because she's the sort of woman that she is and she's gentle and she's understanding and she's loyal, it's a sign which she doesn't see until much later on. The flat was oddly quiet. The Christmas tree lights were off. The kitchen looked as though it had been abandoned mid-breakfast and there was no sign of grace. Farrell immediately felt the blades of panic twist inside his chest. He smelt PJ's hand in this. No, 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 maybe she had just gone upstairs to work. The conflicting explanations passed through Farrell's mind in a flash. He crashed out through the still open door of the flat upstairs to the sublet. He tried to keep his voice calm in case she really was in there. He knocked. Grace? No answer. Farrell put his key in the lock with a shaking hand. Nothing. The room was undisturbed, the same as they had left it the last time they'd worked there together. He ran down to their own flat again. Mouth dry, chest hollow, he went back into the kitchen to look for clues. Toast half eaten, coffee poured. Had he kidnapped her? What had he done? Waited outside all this time until he saw Farrell leave on his own and then pounced on her? She had left him. He was on his own again after all that. All the past defeats, all the fears of another failure built up inside Farrell, tearing through him like a hurricane. He upended the kitchen table, sending cups, sugar bowl, coffee pot flying. They smashed to the ground with satisfying fury. He wanted to break everything, smash everything they had ever used together. The tree. Blindly, Farrell made his way towards the tree in the sitting room, wanting to wrench all the decorations from its limbs, tear it branch from branch. Suddenly, he stopped. There was the sound of the hall door opening. Was it him coming to tell Farrell he had won? Or had she come back? Then he heard Grace's voice, normal, cheerful, greeting someone on their way out. An extraordinary stillness came over him. He felt paralysed, almost dreamlike, but the pounding in his head and heart did not go away. Grace came in and saw him standing by the tree. She was startled. Farrell, what's the matter? Are you all right? He couldn't speak. She had a litre of milk in her hand. Farrell, what is it? Her voice was cautious and afraid, expecting bad news. Farrell sat down heavily on the armchair and stared at the grey embers from last night. 
Grace took off her coat quickly and dropped it on the floor. She left the keys and the carton of milk beside it. She knelt in front of Farrell and took his hands. Farrell, please, what's the matter? Are you sick? His face was a ghastly colour. He was trembling and he seemed to have lost the power of speech. Wait, I'll get you a drop of whisky. She pressed the glass to his lips. She took one of his hands and placed her own over it so that they both held the glass as he sipped. She stroked his hair gently with her free hand. My poor love, you came back early and thought I'd gone. Farrell's face began to regain its normal shape. The formlessness of anger and desolation began to disappear. His eyes finally focused on her and he looked at her with enormous gratitude. Still unable to speak, he just nodded. A tidal wave of shame began to grow inside him for having doubted her. She was now the strong one, he realised. He had helped make her like that. Listen to me, Farrell, Grace said, taking the glass away. Are you okay now? Yeah, I think so. His reply was faint, but audible. She knelt on the floor in front of him, resting her elbows on his knees. I love you, Farrell. We're together now and I'm not going anywhere. And here she smiled at him, except to go out to get milk. I don't like black coffee. Farrell felt tears nudging. A couple escaped and Grace wiped them away with the tips of her fingers. It was as though the madness had finally been released. All the crazy energy was gone. He felt spent, at peace. I'm sorry, Grace, I'm really sorry. It's okay, she said softly. It's okay, now we know what we need to talk about. She stood up and took him by the hand. Come on, you look exhausted, we can talk again later. She led him to the bedroom. He barely made it to the bed before his head started to spin. His last half thought before the flashing lights behind his eyes ceased was that he would prefer never to let her out of his sight. Then he could be sure of her. Wow. That was such a powerful passage to read, Catherine, because just listening to it, I, I swayed from, from one emotion to, to the opposite. You know, I, I thought it's, it was very hard not to feel sorry for him because he was so distraught when he thought she left him. But then that piece at the end is just so menacing and so sinister, you know. Um, and it was, it was something actually that I, I loved, the, the handbag as a symbol, you know, that when she went out, she'd leave her handbag behind her because she knew he was, she, he was worried about her leaving. And she thought if she left her handbag there, he'd know she wasn't gone because, you know, she, she was basically saying, look, I've left my possessions behind. I've left my money behind. Where am I going to go? You know, um, I thought that was, that was a fabulous symbol to use in the book. Um, it's a sort of kindness which Don Hennessy talks about predators exploiting. And I know that there are coercive control relationships which work the other way. But the vast majority of them are the relationships in which men exercise control over women. And that, that passage, I think, is where you see, yes, he is vulnerable. And, and that is the kind of vulnerability that, that these men exploit. And that's the kind of response the kind women that they choose have to them. So it's a very it's a very toxic and a very powerful mix and it's why some people, most people, find it very difficult to extricate themselves from that kind of situation. They need all the support they can get. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Catherine. Um, I'm going to go back to Marion, actually, because I didn't ask Marion to read earlier, and that occurred to me. And I, I know, I know that childhood is is one of the. I, I've no idea what you're about to read, but just to tie in the thing about childhood, it was a topic which Anna Maria Fielding constantly wrote about too, wasn't it? Yes, yes. I'm not saying you have to read something about that, Marion. It's completely up to you. <laughs> book. Uh, this is probably slightly lighter. Well, a lot lighter. <laughs> um, it's, it, it's from one of her sketches. She wrote two series of sketches in 1829 and 1831. And this story is Old Frank, one of her favourites. And um, I suppose just to sort of clarify that it's not all uh, sweetness and, and, and light, uh, one of the an, an academic has, has said, far from being pretty tales of cottage girls and careless youths, 
They are riven with death, abandonment, orphanhood, even Gothic strangeness, and bear witness to a way of life on the cusp of extinction. Now, the story I'm going to read is not that heavy. <laughs> so it's just a very short one and just an excerpt from it. So these sketches, what Anna Maria was trying to do was capture the essence of something. And sketching both in art and writing was seen by the romantics as capturing the real truth of something. So it was, there was a spontaneity about it. And her stories stem from the oral storytelling tradition. And she loved listening to her servants, the people around her. She was born in Dublin, but she spent the first 15 years of her life in Bano in Wexford. So in the story, you'll see her love of Bano, um, her coachman storyteller, old Frank, who tells her all these tales of the fairies. And she's very much aware of the political situation through him as well. So it's just a short excerpt from that. I certainly was a country child. And to escape from study and stroll with Frank, Frank's dogs, and Frank's daughter, my kind and gentle nurse, was one of the greatest of my simple enjoyments. I can hardly tell why, but Bano, in my rem remembrance, always seems like fairyland. Its fields so green, its trees so beautiful, its inhabitants so different from any I have elsewhere met. We used all to wander among the green lanes and fields, and when I was tired, nurse would seat me on an old grey stone or rustic stile, and Frank would lean on his gun and tell me some of the fairy tales or legends with which his memory was so well stored. He had a most confirmed belief in banshees, clericons, clericons are tipsy leprechauns, fairies and mermaids, and if Mary, who was very superior to the general order of servants, ever presumed to doubt the truth of one of her father's stories, he reproved her in no gentle terms. And no wonder, he had a mark in his hand, which was actually given by an arrow, shot at him by a fairy queen, one evening when he was returning home after a quiet carouse at Mr. Talbot's. He could never be prevailed upon to root up large mushrooms, fairy tables, or to pull bulrushes, fairy horses, lest he might offend the good people. My favourite story was The Stout and Strong of Heart, and I believe it was Frank's favourite also. For many enough to a time has he repeated it to me, and always have I listened with attention, pleasing the old man, while I was myself delighted. I will give it my readers, although I fear it will lose much from the absence of my ancient friend, who with so much earnestness and native humour related it. And I'll just skip slightly forward to, she, she proceeds to tell the story of, of a young couple who got married on the night of the wedding. Um, Ellen, the, the, the new bride, was stolen by the fairies. Um, he's res she's rescued back, but then when she has her first baby, she's stolen again. So it's, it's, it's all the kind of folklore and for fairy tales of changelings that comes through in her writing. And she's collecting these stories and reproducing them through her own stories. So when she finishes the storytelling, um, she has a lot of these stories within stories, and she goes on to tell about Frank and how he saved um, his master during the 1798 rebellion. So there's just a paragraph on that. Frank delighted in telling stories of the rebellion, but he left it to others to recount what true and faithful service he had rendered his master and mistress in that perilous time. And they were nothing loath to do him ample justice. I have often heard how he buried the best wine in the asparagus beds to save it from falling into the hands of the rebels, and how he had concealed his favourite horses in the hen and turkey houses, and how at the risk of his life he carried a forged order to General Roach, who commanded the rebel forces in the town of Wexford, which order purported to come from another rebel chief, and demanded the instant freedom of his master, whose life was thus preserved." It was in the summer of 1798 that my grandfather, who had been for a few days in Dublin on business of importance, embarked with his constant attendant, Frank, on board a small Wexford trading vessel. Intelligence had reached them of the disturbed state of the country, and as land travelling was unsafe, the boat was engaged to convey them direct to the Bay of Bano. As they passed Dockey Isle and coasted along the beautiful shores of Wicklow, glowing in the full richness of summer, the sea breeze tempering the fervid heat with its invigorating freshness, my grandfather thought he had never seen the country look so tranquil or so happy. 
And then she proceeds, proceeds to tell the story of how the, the master gets arrested and how the old Frank dresses him up and, and saves him through. He saved his life three times in 48 hours. So it's a very entertaining story. You can see how to be, um, when you read it in its entirety, how the, the English audiences enjoy this spontaneity about this um, these people of the town of Bano, and a little bit like Angela Flannery earlier on, where she has her story, The Amusement, set in Tremor. This is set in Bano. You get to know Father Mike, Captain Andy, Jack the Shrimp, all these characters, people, her stories, and appear again and again. So um, that's a bit, basically. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marion. And as I say, you have so many diverse extracts in the book. Um, I'm going to open it up to the floor now because I'm sure there will be some questions um, for our authors or for Alan. So if anybody has a question that they'd like to ask. Just a simple one, please. What's yes. the name of Marion's book? A Life of No Light Toil. A Life of No Light Toil. Yeah. It's a quote from her writing. I have it explained in the, in the, in the introduction, but it was suitably Victorian. So, uh. Anna Maria Fielding Hall. She was, yeah, she was often known as Mrs. S. C. Hall because her husband took a great uh, pride and ownership of a lot of her work. Uh, burned all his. Her letters to him, but kept all his to her. <laughs> I think we had a discussion yesterday with um, Martina and Pauline about a very Victorian kind of marriage. <laughs> but there's a fair bit about that in, in, in the... But often she signed it as AMH, not, you know, the way again in Victorian times, is she a man or woman or what, you know, just often as a, sa a sales thing, having the initials was, uh, and an awful lot of women writers did that, obviously George Eliot, George Sand, but um, many, many of the, the authors, or else, anon. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. And any other questions from the audience? Mary, yeah. I'd like to praise you all, those terrific Thank you, because your books, I remember when they came out, um, I remember the impact they made on me, and it was terrific. Can I, 
That, that's Mary Dorsey who's, who's uh, speaking there and she has a wonderful essay in Alan's anthology, Look, It's a Woman Writer as well, yeah. Um, Leah, yeah. Just really quickly, thank you, Mary. And of course, your own writing broke down a few barriers for people, women in particular as well. It's that privacy, I think. There's an intimacy between a reader and the page that you can let anything happen in your own mind and you can go anywhere and that's what literature really does. It opens up other dimensions of life um, and makes them possible. But only if you can get the book published <laughs> in the first place. <laughs> and that's, that's the whole point of this series. So when, when Ivan started the series in 1980, it was always planned it would be 19th and 20th century women. So some were living and some were dead. So when the first Kate O'Brien came out in 1980, immediately a number of women, uh, contemporary women, contacted Ivan, one of whom was Nora Holt, and one was Mary Lavin. And I have this extraordinary bundle of letters, handwritten letters from Mary Lavin, uh, talking about her book in the series. And for, for Nora Holt, who has been reclaimed in recent years by, by Sinead Gleeson. Uh, yeah, she lived in Bray in her, for her last decade but she was living in poverty. So I found the record. So in 1984, Ireland House published the very first anthology of reclamation of short stories. So the predecessor of The Long Days Back, and it was called Woman's Part. And that was a mixture of living women like Mary Lavin and Una Troy, um, about 10, maybe 10 living and 10, and 10 dead. So Nora Holt, for example, got 100 pounds from Ireland House in 1984, which I remember I was 13 at the time and we used to get 50p a week pocket money and I thought I was rich. So I can imagine Nora Holt kept Bray going. The pubs in Bray anyway kept going. Um, so as I say, that, so that's why the series is now is still a mixture of contemporary writers and dead writers. So with the contemporary writers, both Leah and Catherine have written the most beautiful afterwards. And then with Leah's book, Paula, Ger Paula Gerrity wrote the, um, the foreword. And with Ka Paula McCaffrey, sorry, and uh, with Catherine's book, Mia Gallagher wrote a beautiful uh, foreword. And then the other two books, we, we launched these five books, was it April or May? April. April. My brain isn't uh, working today. No, I'm not, unfortunately not. I wish I was. Um, the, the, I mentioned Kate O'Brien. The other book launched in April was Annie Smithson, who was the biggest selling writer in Ireland in the 20s, 30s and 40s. Unfortunately, even feminists now have not properly assessed her work. And it's, it's, it's a constant problem where you see academic studies and there's a couple of sentences about a writer. And when you, you think this is the expert talking about the writer, but you realise actually afterwards they haven't read anything and they're just regurgitating stuff. So Annie Smithson is, is, is listed as romantic Catholic novelist. But actually, when you read her work, it, it, there is extraordinary stuff. And this book, Carmen Cavan, is set in Donegal in 1911, where Smithson was a district nurse and lived in the you know, wilderness in Donegal. And she'd be called up to the mountains when a woman was giving birth, and it would be a five-hour journey up the mountain. And actually, I gave the book yesterday to a district nurse who was visiting my mother, and she was uh, thrilled to get a book for, about w women like her from 100 years ago. So I'm dying to hear what she thinks of it. But the book has suicide. It has, also, it has infanticide. Uh, there's extraordinary stuff in it. And all your, I can more or less guarantee you, nearly all your grandmother, your mother is your grandmother's red Smithson. She was a huge influence on women all for most of the 20th century and she was a, a very empowering influence because all her women characters are, are heroes there's no victims the men actually in many cases are the victims so annie smithson was the fifth book and i'm very pleased to say today the sixth book arrived from the printers and it's the mill in the north patricia o'connor and she was Dun born in Donegal, but lived most of her life in Down and Belfast. She was the most staged female playwright in Ireland in the 40s and 50s. She wrote, this was her first novel, she wrote a second novel. And this novel is set, The Mill in the North, it's set in a county down village in the 30s, and it's about sectarianism and uh, family loyalty and dysfunction. And 
it's a fascinating read. Uh, some of the dialogue is in the local uh, accent of the time. Um, so as I say, this is the sixth book, and I'm very happy to, to say that the next book in the series will actually be Mary Rose Callahan, who, as I mentioned earlier, was first published by Arlen House in 1979, and it's Mary Rose's The Awkward Woman. Uh, and there's about 20 more in different stages. <laughs> So this, that's what's keeping me busy. Um, but none of these books have any funding, so I'm relying on the public to support the books, and there's no shortage of books here. <laughs> just one, one quick word, just because Mary was talking about um, activism, and Anna Maria Fielding Hall was very active and philanthropic, and she... Uh, helped to support a hospital in Brompton. She looked after governesses and was doing endless bazaars for, what was it, the, the Society of Sick and Decayed Governesses. <laughs> but always active throughout her life. Temperance was another big thing. Her, the Drunkard's Bible, the, 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 the little flyer for it, sold half a million copies. <laughs> Surprise. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I know you're probably all going, it's probably time to wrap up, but I do have to say something on behalf of academics. Um, we've had a number of remarkable feminists, in particular academics, who have been doing a lot of work in reclaiming the works of these women, and uh, they're not all as dismissive um, as, as Alan mentioned, although that does happen too. But really, I think it's, it's the work of the academy as much as anything else of universities that keeps an interest going in the literature of the past and it's really important and it's really not to be underestimated. Leah, thank you very much and thank you to everybody on our panel here today. Thank you to Alan Hayes, especially for the tireless work he does for us women writers here in Ireland. And Catherine said also for the beautiful books that he produces. And as Alan said, he finances this himself. It's something I really hope to see change in the future because Ireland House is one of the most important publishers that we have. I think you'll, you'll realize that just listening to Alan and listening to the authors speaking today. Um, we have to get behind Ireland House. We have to keep this press going. Um, it's really, really important. Thank you to Marion and Leah and Catherine for their wonderful readings, their scintillating discussion. Give them a big round of applause.